Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of 4C Chemistry, or in fact, anybody else who happens to be listening. Welcome back to National 5 um, Chemistry, and today we are going to take our second look at covalent bonding. I'm going to open this with a quest. I'm going to open this with a set the scene. Imagine yourself strolling along Nairn Beach, or if you're further afield, wherever your nice local beach happens to be, if you're lucky enough to have one. That stroll along the beach is going to involve covalent bonding in two very different ways. Um, two of the weird things that covalent bonding can do, and it's also a wonderful hint towards ionic bonding, which we haven't done yet. I'm not sure if we'll cover towards the end of the term. Might need to wait until next year. Right, so, walking along the beach. What on earth has that got to do with covalent bonding? I will come to that, but the very first thing I would like to do, folks, is I would like to show you this. Now, this is the first time I've shown or mentioned any of the official documentation that goes with our National 5 Chemistry course. I will attach the document to this assignment. Don't flap about it, though. What I'm doing is I'm just showing you what are called learning outcomes and the detail of which the SQA expects you to know these learning outcomes. So we're going to start with these ones here. You probably can't read this on the screen, so I'll read it out to you. This is covalent bonding. The SQA want you to know, to know that covalent bonds form between non-metals. Fine, we covered that last time. They also want you to know that a covalent bond forms when two positive nuclei uh, are held together by their attraction for the negative electrons. Nuclei are positive, electrons are negative. That was in a diagram in my last video. If you want to go back and look at covalent bonding one, I'll put a link in the description if I can remember how to do that. I'm new to all this video stuff. Um, we also drew diagrams of how you could share pairs of electrons. You can share more than one pair of electrons, of course. Oxygen shares two pairs and nitrogen shares three pairs. Whereas something like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, they just share one pair. So does hydrogen. They also want you to know the Hofbrinkles, as I call them, the seven diatomic elements. They go about in pairs, if you remember why, that's because atoms are more stable when their outer layer is completely full. And they achieve a full outer layer in covalent bonding by sharing pairs of electrons. That's what a covalent bond is. Okay, that's a recap from last time. And what I would like to do today is I would look to, like to look at uh, three things. I would like to look at the shapes of some molecules, because down here it says the shape of some molecules. So the SQA want you to know four different shapes of molecules, and I just happen to have models of them so you can see them. I'm going to do structures, covalent structures. A covalent bonding can do two different things, and that's exemplified by Nairn Beach, believe it or not. I keep coming back to the beach, you'll see why. It's really cool, in a really geeky way, but it's incredibly cool. And I'm going to lastly look at the properties of covalent structures. So that's the three things today, guys. The shapes of some molecules, the structures you can make with covalent bonding, and the properties that they have. Let's stick with the molecules first. They, they being the SQA, want you to know um, four different shapes of molecule. Let's have that one there. Let's have uh, that one there. Uh, let's have, I've lost my ammonia, there we go. Let's have this one here. Let's pretend that hole isn't there. Okay, please just have a blank for that. Um, and lastly, we have this object here. Now let's look at type one, the simplest type. So this is shapes of molecules. By the way, the eagle eyes amongst you will notice that this is an element, but this is definitely a compound. So we've moved away from simple elements. We're now into compounds. But they're all, they're all covalent bonding. So this one here is what's called linear, which is like a line. And that's, say, H2 or N2 or O2. It's all of our Hofbrinkles. They're all linear. And this guy here as well. This is carbon dioxide. Quite cool shape, that. That's CO2. So we'll stick that down there. That's a compound that's also linear. So straight line, guys. Nice and simple. Whoops. Can't go wrong with that. Uh, let's move on to, leave that there, if we can, if we can fit it all in. Let's move on to type 2, which is this, my glass of water. Maybe you're starting to see the Nairn Beach connection now. I wonder what the sand's got to do with it. So this is a covalent molecule, guys, and this is called angular. If you're really interested in why this angle is like that, come back in sixth year and ask me, and I will explain it and make everything clear. So this is angular, and a classic, oh, don't do that, hey, 
A classic example of an angular is water. Um, this one here is, I don't know if you can see that on camera. Yeah, you can. It's, it's like a little pyramid. That's the bottom of the pyramid. That's the top of the pyramid. So, not surprisingly, it's called pyramidal. So, pyramidal, 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 however you want to pronounce it. Uh, this is one of my least favourite molecules in the universe ever. Uh, ammonia. This smells of pee. Incredibly concentrated pee because that's what's in urine. Your body chops this molecule here off of bigger molecules and then dumps it into your urine and you pee it out. There's a very sensible reason for that because that's surprisingly poisonous. You don't want it hanging out about in your body. By the way, you notice I'm starting to use some shapes here, guys. I should, of course, do the shape for, for example, oxygen. That was a double bond because you were sharing two pairs of electrons. These lines, can I just remind you that each of these lines is actually a shared pair of electrons. It's just that life is too short to go through drawing it the whole version all the time. You could if you fancy. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two. So that's, I mean, that's the full version. That's the cut down version. So we just show this, this pair of electrons as being lines. And of course, on the models, that represents the shared pair of electrons, these grey plastic rods. They're great, actually, these models. This shows you the shape, the pyramidal shape. Um, and you notice I've drawn one of them coming out the page. That's what that meant. That's what that's meant to be. Which just leaves us with this sort of shape here. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is called a tetra because it's a four-sided pyramid. So one, two, three, four. It's called a tetrahedron or tetrahedral, actually. When you're describing something with an adjective. Tetrahedral. That's our four shapes of molecules. So that is the first thing I wanted to talk about. How do you draw the heck do you draw a tetrahedron on the page? Well, the, the official way is this. It's quite cool actually. This is meant to show this hydrogen fading away into the page. This is meant to show the hydrogen coming out of the page at you. And this is the other hydrogen. If we were in the class, I would do a funky disco dance maneuver, which is hilarious considering I'm an old fart, um, to demonstrate the shape. But there you go, you can see it. Fortunately, I've got these models that I took home to help my son with his chemistry. Fortunately, just before shutdown, it was great timing. Um, that's the first thing I want to do, guys. So there are four shapes of molecules and some examples of them. Feel free to pause the screen if you want to make your own notes at this point in time. And we're back. Covalent structures, um, stop saying M there, just go on with it. Covalent structures can be one of two types. The SQA are using these terms, so we will also use these terms. So you come across them in exam questions, you know what they mean. You can have type 1, which are called discrete molecules. That does not mean they keep a secret. Discrete in this context means they are separate from each other. The other option is a giant covalent network. Unfortunately, I've got a model of this, but it's in the classroom and we're stuck outside the classroom just now. Once we're back in, I can show you it. Fortunately, I can show you discrete molecules here. There we go. Now, what have we got going on here? We've got a whole bunch of molecules of water. Just two seconds. <laughs> I'm definitely new to this video, carry on. I just said just two seconds and walked out the room after pausing the video. You won't see a gap. So, in fact, we could have ourselves a couple of glasses of water. So if I pour out my glass of water, you can see that the covalent bonds hold the hydrogen to the oxygen, but you do not have any covalent bonds between the individual molecules. They are separate or discrete from each other. Famous SQA trick question tries to lead you into saying, oh yeah, there's covalent bonds between the molecules. No, there's not. There's covalent bonds inside the molecule, not between them. There is something between them, but we don't need to worry about that until you get to higher. Uh, giant covalent network. Yeah, I need some models for this. And uh, the best I could do, I'm sorry, the best I could do is print some out. So let's move my discrete molecules here for a second. 
Here's an example of a famous giant quail network. It's a diamond. Diamonds contain just carbon, nothing else. And you can see that they've said there's a carbon atom in the blob, and you've said the covalent bond between the carbon atoms. Now, the only my only problem with this sort of diagram is you tend to look at it and say, oh yeah, that's where the diamond stops. It's not. Because these just continue out with bonds forever, really. Well, until you reach the edge of your particular diamond that you're dealing with. Did I just put three bonds in that? What a muppet. You can't have a valency of five for carbon. Please remember that's what the valency actually is when it comes to covalence. It's the number of bonds you form. So scratch that. I do apologise, folks. You can't get a staff, can you? It's just shocking. So, one, two, three, four. There you go, guys. So each of these, it just continues out forever until you reach the physical edge of the diamond that's in your diamond necklace, whatever, ring. So the whole diamond is one massive big molecule. How cool is that? That's why it's called, closing the word of course, giant covalent network. There are covalent bonds everywhere holding all the atoms together in one huge block. Another nice example of this is silicon dioxide, which if we continue here, oxygen by the way is in brown here, silicon is in blue. Silicon also has a valency of four, so there should in theory be four bonds coming out of every blue one. So we can fix that, can't we? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Put another one on there. Da, da, da. Uh, so, um, and another bond out here. I'm hoping that you can see that this will also just continue. Oxygen has a valency of two, by the way, which is why there's only two bonds on the oxygen. Uh, this will continue out forever as well until you reach the edge of the grain of sand because that is what silicon dioxide is. It's quartz, which is ground up to make the sand that we're strolling along Nairn Beach. So, as a nice example of this, if we have my glass of water here, this water is individual little molecules like this. Whereas the grains of sand on the beach are, believe it or not, giant covalent networks. If you had a chunk of quartz the size of your fist, the whole thing would be one big molecule. So that was point two, guys, I wanted to cover. I wanted to cover the fact that covalent structures can be one of two separate things. They can be, hold on two seconds, can I? Well, hold on two seconds this time. Right, so um, we've got the, the, the whole picture here for the structures, guys. You can have individual little molecules. Yes, they've got covalent bonds in them. No, the covalent bonds don't hold them to their neighbours. They only hold the atoms together within the molecule. Or you can have a giant covalent network, uh, which... Everything is held together by covalent bonds. What difference does that make? Well, quite a lot when we go on to the third point, which is their physical properties. So let's have a look at the physical properties of these two different structures. See if they've got anything different between them. So this is physical properties of covalent structures. They've got something in common, both individual molecules and the big giant networks. First of all, the, uh, so if we do the, why don't we do, yeah, discrete molecules. Let's do it just exactly like we had before. Discrete molecules and giant covalent networks. Property number one that they have in common. Where's my colored pens going? Property number one. They never conduct electricity. You can try if they're solid, you can try if they're liquid, uh, you can try if they're a gas if you fancy, doesn't make any difference. They never conduct electricity. And they've got that in common with the giant covalent networks. That applies to all covalents, guys. Never conduct electricity. Uh, property number, so conduction, that's the first property they want you to, they being the SQA, let me just check the properties, two seconds, I've lost my, where my learning outcomes go, there we go, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
Yeah, they only want you to... Oh no, they've died. That's a new one. Okay. Uh, property number two. They want you to look at the melting and boiling points. So, discrete molecules like water or oxygen gas, in fact. The oxygen gas you're breathing is a discrete molecule as well. They tend to have low melting and boiling points. They can be seriously low, like minus a couple of hundred, up to a couple of hundred positive, couple of hundred, depending on what you're dealing with. Uh, that might not seem low to you. <laughs> Wait to you get to these guys. Uh, giant covalent networks. Oh, by the way, the reason for that, the reason for that is quite simple. If you're separating one water molecule from its neighbour, there's nothing much to break, really. You know, there's these mysterious forces that we talk about higher, but once you've separated them, great. They fly off as a gas. These guys, on the other hand, if you want to try and melt a diamond, you're going to have to try and break covalent bonds. You have no choice. You've got to break covalent bonds to separate this atom from its neighbours. Well, good luck with that. You're talking up in the thousands. So, incredibly... So very high melting and boiling points. Oops, sorry. Uh, plus thousands. So that's the dead giveaway for these guys. They never conduct electricity. Sky high melting and boiling points. Boom. It's a giant covalent network. On the other hand, if they never conduct electricity and the seriously low melting and boiling points, that's discrete molecules. The... I just noticed, by the way, sorry, that they've crept in recent years. They, they actually want you to know why covalent substances don't conduct electricity. And the simple answer to that is they have no charged particles in them. Everything is neutral. That's a big hint that I'm going to say, unlike ionic compounds. But we'll kind of come back to that in another lesson. So the no charged particles, that's why they don't conduct electricity in any forms. The third thing that they wanted to mention is dissolving. Uh, so giant covalent networks basically are insoluble. That's a, nice, that's a nice one for sand, of course. You really wouldn't want your sand to dissolve in the water. You're going to lose your beaches really quickly that way. So insoluble, discrete molecules can sometimes dissolve. Solubility is a wee bit complex. So I can't see the SQA asking you that much of the time. And I think that's all I wanted to cover today, guys. Could we take a quick look through the learning outcomes and just see if there's anything I have missed? Because we got down to here. The shape of simple covalent molecules depends on the number of bonds and the orientation. That just means the position. They can be linear, angular, trigonal, pyramidal. I just called it pyramidal um, or tetrahedral. Uh, just to be a reminder, you can have multiple bonds, like oxygen with a double bond or nitrogen with a triple bond. Covalent substances can either form discrete molecules or giant covalent networks. And the second page of learning outcomes, they want you to know that covalent molecules, so that's discrete molecules, have strong bonds inside the molecule and only weak forces between the molecules. I talked about that already. They want you to know that covalent molecules, that's in the discrete molecules, have low melting and boiling points because it's easy to separate their molecules from their neighbouring molecules. And last of all, don't conduct electricity because they don't have any charged particles. Uh, it does say here covalent molecular substances which don't dissolve in water might dissolve in other solvents. We will come back to that another day. Don't worry about that one. Covalent networks have a big network of strong covalent bonds within one giant structure Sky-high melting and boiling points, because it's difficult to break covalent bonds, and don't dissolve. And they've repeated themselves down here for some reason. In general, covalent network substances don't conduct electricity. And I think we're done for today. Thanks for listening, folks. I'll get some questions for you to try.